we are just really excited to uh, to have Chris Hanner up here to uh, to be able to talk about it. And uh, Chris, welcome to ChaserCon, and the uh, floor yours. Thanks, Roger. I just want to first off, uh, Roger and Karen, you guys do just a fantastic job. Everyone, just keep, let's give it up for Roger. Thank you so much. Be ourselves, basically. There's no, there's nothing better than that. Uh, my talk is a uh, shoot, develop, share, uh, making most of your stored memories. Uh, you know, honestly, there's a lot of people that could be giving this talk. Uh, I've been, I'm sharing this stage with a lot of greats too. I mean, my goodness, Tim Marshall was up here yesterday. Tim Marshall's right there. I, I, I don't fit. I don't feel like I deserve to be up here or something. So it, it, there's just a lot of people. I mean, Karen could be giving this talk. I mean, there's a lot of great photographers out here. So. Uh, let's just talk about uh, who I am, just in case you do not know, and that's very possible. Uh, my name is Chris Center, of course, I mean, that's obvious. Uh, I am the co-founder of TornadoTitans.com, a uh, little outfit of ragtag storm chasers that roam the plains in search of water vapor that spins violently, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, uh, I produced the Tornado Titans web series uh, from 2010 to 2012, we reached half a million people. Uh, that was really fun. It was so fun that I'm actually going to do a fourth season this year. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. I produced a, a documentary called The Bear's Cage in 2013. And, uh, you know, that's a 45 minute documentary. It talks about the story of storm chasing. Very proud of it. Very awesome thing. And then uh, also, creator of Titan U. It's going, it, right now it's just a bunch of, I guess, free resources for storm chasers, but we're expanding that and making it for the general public, adding uh, preparedness, that sort of thing. It's going to be a bunch of free resources, videos, etc. So that's going to be a really fun project we're also shooting this spring. So, let's get back on topic, because I want to talk about SDS, which I'm not talking about SDS, where you know, we're, we're all suffering from it. But, uh, shooting, developing, and sharing. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to create great images. Uh, this, this is actually April 20th. It's 2009, the day before the road tornado. Beautiful, super cell near Willow. Uh, I just want to talk about, uh, you know, we're going to talk about composition, and then we're going to talk about photo pro post processing, then we're going to get into video for a second. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about copyright and we'll be done. So bear with me if you can stand it and we'll make this work. Uh, this is the uh, most important thing I want to impress, and I don't know whose head is 16 inches. I don't know where this quote came from and whose head is actually 16 inches long. But, anyways, it is the, that, that behind your camera is the most important thing to creating a great image. It doesn't matter what camera body you have, it doesn't matter what you have. If you yourself in, in, that, in that space behind the camera, in your head, if you are not creating great images inside of your head and composing and framing properly, you're not creating anything great. So that, that's going to be the first thing I want to press, is that you have to, have to, have to think about what you're doing. <coughs> Shoot. Okay. We're going to talk about composition. Beautiful supercell, May 29, 2012, near Piedmont, Oklahoma, actually. There, uh, we're going to talk about arranging elements in the frame and just kind of, you know, figuring out where you want to put things. Uh, then we're going to learn how to minimize your shots so you don't have a bunch of distractions because that's important. And uh, also, uh, just to shoot, we, we got we got to learn to push that shutter button. So arranging elements. Uh, the big thing is is that. You, if, if you just shoot a storm, you just shoot the clouds or something, you don't really get perspective on the scale of the storm. Storms are massive. I mean, we can all agree on that. There's big, mean things. So you want to make sure that you have some massive <coughs> scale to uh, these, give to these storms the scale they need. And sometimes that can be accomplished with a simple windmill or, uh, you know, a tank battery on the horizon if you're in the Texas Panhandle or, you know, or Western Oklahoma, really anywhere down there. Uh, you know, and uh, we're going to use the rule of thirds uh, with a bit of a different twist. I'm going to talk about, I don't know if anybody knows what the rule of thirds is, but it's uh, very interesting. Uh, where basically, you know, you divide your image in third lines. That's very shaky and horrible, but you, I think you got the picture. Uh, so, you know, you can divide, you divide your images into third. You want to place important elements on that, you know, say a third. That road is going down the left third line right there. So we want to do that leading lines. This road's a great leading line into the sky. You know, it leads, draws your eye into the storm and it gives depth to the image. You want to create out of it. Images are two D. Either and I'm talking photos and video. Uh, they're two D images. I mean that's very two D. But you want to create depth 
So and simulate it so it looks 3D. That's that's the key to a great image is making an image looks like where your eye just can just go in and just take a journey in a, in a fantastic journey. So the rule of thirds for storms. You know some people and this is May 29th again. I guess I love that day. You know this is not a third of the way through. What I say is that there's there's two different ways you can do the rule of thirds in, in a range just with the basic framework. You can put this horizon on the third line, and I do that sometimes. And that, that's a good basic landscape technique. But we're shooting storms, and there's a lot of, a, you know, there's a lot of storm. So oftentimes I say you want to put the third, bottom third on the cloud base layer. And that, you know, that usually results in that area in the bottom there being about 10 to 20 percent of the bottom part of the frame. And that allows more of the storm to be in the frame because inherently we're shooting storms, not pictures of wheat fields. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody has very many great pictures of wheat fields. I know Stephen Locke, I don't know if he's watching, but he has a few. He's really good at what he does. But uh, yeah, you just, you want to have great storm photos. And that's the very first thing you do is you got to arrange the photos in such a way that you can fit it all within. So let's talk about minimizing. Uh, you know, we, 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 we've got the horizon on the third line, or we've got the cloud base on the third line, now what do you do? Well, the big thing is that oftentimes, as storm chasers, we go crazy when something awesome is happening. I mean, you just lose it. And that, that, that happens to me far more than it ever should. But, you know, uh, you know, you see something amazing and you just go, oh, I gotta, I gotta get the camera out and start shooting. And you just start, you know, clicking away. And it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy what we do. So, you, you basically, uh, you know, you need to minimize your shots. Uh, you know, anything that does not belong in the shot, I mean, that does, it, it takes away from the storm. If you have a power line, it's going to take away. If you have a bunch of buildings, it's going to take away from the storm shot, almost, almost certainly. You want to take as much out of the picture as you can, and that's accomplished uh, via a, a very, very complex method. I mean, it's a very complex, it, it's called walking. So, I mean, you have to walk to get stuff out. I mean, it, it, if you stand still and you're sitting there, oh, how, how, do I, how do I change this? Well, it, it's actually quite simple. It's, it, it's, it's like, almost like dancing, you know? So, you know, and that, that, that's how you fix that. Okay, so, and this is a beautiful storm. Uh, this was August 17, 2009. One of those amazing low-risk kind of days uh, near uh, what's on the Oklahoma beautiful supercell. And less is more. Don't clutter up your images. I mean, you can see... Right here, there is a little farmstead right there, and that is uh, that gives that storm just this massive scale. It looks just absolutely massive against that, and just don't and just don't use too much. Uh, I mean, just don't put much in there. I mean, I, I'm going to I'm going to show a bunch of images that I don't follow all of my rules either. So all my rules are meant to be broken, and in your own, it's okay if you mess up. It happens to me all the time. So, uh, you know, and thank goodness for digital, because if I was shooting film, this would, you know, if some people here probably did start out shooting film, you know, you only have 24 shots in a roll of film, you know, you might have 72 shots total. How horrible would that be? I know a lot of people, I've talked to some that say, yeah, I go out and I shoot uh, about a thousand frames in a storm chase. And I'm like, well, you might have a good shot in there. Maybe. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it just, it, you know, the, the secret to shooting great is actually, uh, and then even video, you know, I shoot a bunch of video, and, and you just want to, instead of shooting to where, you know, you can, there's a lot of people say, well, I'll just fix it in Photoshop. Well, you can fix it in Photoshop, but why spend that time fixing it in Photoshop when, seriously, you can do that little dance, and you can seriously get rid of most of your problems. So, let's talk about some cardinal sins of storm photography. You know, everything, everyone does something wrong eventually. I mean, geez, what, what the heck is that window doing in the top right right there? This was uh, November 10th near Sharon, Oklahoma. 2012, Mother Nature decided to give me a birthday present. It was actually quite an enjoyable day. So let's just talk about some things that everyone does wrong eventually. Uh, the first one, and people who know me and have actually, I, I do like Google Hangouts every now and then, and I'll talk about stuff like this. They're, they're laughing right now because this is the thing I'm always harp on. Power lines horizontal in your shot. It does nothing but split. I mean, I don't. You, you probably can't see it very well, but and I'm going to use this shot again because it's just so terrible. But uh, this is a supercell in north central Texas, but this power line right here is going halfway through my shot, and it does nothing but split it in half. You know, how do I fix it? Well, it's actually quite simple. I can just, you know, take off. Obviously, you don't want to just take off running across the road. You better look, stop looking and listen. That's very important. But you, you, want, to, uh, you want to take off running. I'm serious. It's the, I, I, my life was saved once by somebody because I did not stop looking and listen. So you, you, it, it's not worth it. So, but, but stop looking and listen and take off across that road. 
And uh, get that shot without those power lines in it. Uh, another one, a fence cutting in. Okay, and this, this is the shot that annoys me to know it. This is a beautiful supercell, May 30th, 2013, just west of Chickasha, Oklahoma. Beautiful wall cloud. I mean, you got these beautiful rain vents. You can even see storms forming back there. Uh, and what, what are you doing? What, what, what is that little rascal doing there? And, you know, honestly, I, I, I'm going to tell you guys what I could have done to fix this image. It's very simple. Don't know why I did it. I mean, I'm serious. I'm going to fix it for you. It's fixed. No more fixed. I don't know why. I don't know why that happens. I, you, you, I'm, I'm serious. You're like, oh, a wall cloud. I got to take a picture. And I take the picture and I go back in the car because for whatever reason. And, you know, I come back and I'm like, why, why did I do this? And, and, you know, I could use Photoshop and completely heal <coughs> and you can do it. But that's about 30 minutes worth of work that is solved by taking a step. You know, why, why, why do we do these things? Why do we do these things? I don't know. Uh, again, oh, here's that image again, shooting across the road again. Just take, just get, get that road out of there. It does nothing for the image, really. I mean, it, 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 especially because it's just so diagonal. I don't know. I just, it's, that, that day I was just not feeling storm chasing. I just went because it was the first severe risk of the year and whatever. So, you, know, you do that sometimes. Okay, so let's talk about exposure. And, you know, let's talk about the ideal settings for well-exposed sharp photos. We, we've talked about arranging photos. And the big thing is, is that you've got to move when uh, putting elements in your shot to ensure that it just looks good. I mean, if you got a power line, you got to, you know, just, there, there's going to be a scene. you just got to take your time. Uh, as far as exposure, this is more technical camera talk. Uh, some rules of the road. Uh, the first thing is that if you want the very best photos, if you want to shoot your absolute best photo, you have to do man. You have to shoot man. You've got to learn how to control your aperture and shutter speed, and you've got to just make that. If you're not shooting manual, you're basically allowing the camera to make the decisions for you. And I don't know if you guys have seen Terminator or iRobot <coughs> machines and have them make decisions for you. It never ends well. I mean, I'm just telling you, it never ends well. So don't allow the machines to take, to take control. And for the best photos, you also have to shoot raw. And, uh, you know, uh, there's this thing, you know, people say, well, I shoot JPEG. Well, that's great. But you're literally, again, you're giving the camera all the control in the world. It takes it processes them for you, and then you lose data. Uh, raw, you get all the data in the world, and uh, you just, I mean, you make it happen. I mean, that's the best way to put it. You can do all kinds of fun stuff. So, make sure that you shoot raw and you learn to shoot manual. We're going to try to teach you a little bit about shooting manual right now. Uh, first thing, managing your exposure. I just talked about you have aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Now, to explain it in, in layman's terms, aperture is like your pupil in your eye. You know, the darker it is, the more, you know, the bigger your pupils have to get to allow more light. And that's your aperture. It has, it, it controls the amount of light that comes in. Shutter speed is, the, the best way to put it is that it's when your eyes blink. You know, you, you keep it open, if you keep your eyes open for a long time in the dark, you can start seeing things better. Well, it's the same thing with the camera. If you keep your shutter open a lot longer, you can see more light. And ISO is digital gain. It's uh, actually evil and dishonest, and you don't want to use it unless you have to. It's, it's literally, it's the, it's the red button. You, you, you know, they say don't push the red button. Well, that's the red button. So don't push it unless you have to. That's in an emergency. So aperture. Uh, let's talk about it for a second. You know, it, uh, I, I already described it. Uh, so it, it's weird because they say uh, shooting the lower aperture means you're actually the number is going up. And when you open up, your number is actually going down. Uh, the ideal settings for storms, I mean, this, this is meant to be broken. I mean, all photography rules are meant to be broken, but this is just my general rules of the road. Uh, F7.1 to F11 in that range, it, it gives you that, it does, you don't get into diffraction, which lowers your image quality, but it's deep, it gives you this deep depth of field, which means that there's more stuff in focus. And you want to have, you know, the best landscape photos out there. And the best storm photos. I mean, you got these, you know, little pieces of wheat or whatever in the foreground that's sharp as attack, and then you just go out and storm sharp. That's how they do it. They use these uh, deep, deep depths of field, uh, and that's that's how you do that. And that's a beautiful sunset, actually, after in the sad June of 2013, where I saw that beautiful sunset as the storm chase. That's about it. So, but it was a beautiful sunset. Uh, shutter speed. This controls how long your shutter is open. Uh, my general rule is you don't want to go more than four or five seconds. Uh, you know, you can, you can do all kinds of cool techniques uh, as far as uh, stacking photos for lightning at night, that sort of thing. 
But if you go longer than five seconds, and this could be even shorter when you get into those crazy fast movers in the early season where they're going you know, 40 or 50 miles an hour, but if you go longer, your, your clouds are going to start blurring. And that's just, it's just no, no blame. I mean, it, the things just do not go well when you guys start uh, blurring and you, know, you start losing the detail. So try to keep it under five seconds for sure. And I try to keep it under four. I mean, every lightning shot I've ever taken has been less than four second shutter. For video, uh, I, this, this is the fun part, you know. I shoot either 24p or 60p. Uh, 30p is like that weird middle ground that really isn't good at anything, so I try to avoid it. But 24p gives you that cinematic look, and 60p gives you that more realistic, fluid look. Uh, and so for shutter speed for that, you don't want to go less than double the frame rate. So, you know, if you're shooting 24, you want to go 48. If you're shooting 60, you want to go 120. And, and, how you, and, and the big thing with that is that if you go lower, you can start getting this jittery look in your video. And it's great if you're shooting something at night and you, you just got to get the shot, but do not, I mean, that, that, that's just, that's asking for a lot of trouble if you, uh, if you do that. And, uh, you know, one more note on the video settings. Uh, I guess the best way to put it is that uh, if you're shooting, you know, I, I, the debate between 60 and 24p is, I mean, it's a complex one as far as which one you should shoot. I am personally, this year, I mean, last year I shot 60p. This year I'm shooting 24p, so, you know, it's not an open and shut case. There's no answer. But uh, basically, I like uh, 24p because I get a little bit more data in each frame. And also, for low light, you can step the shutter further down. Obviously, 48 is a lot smaller, so you can get more light in, so more light. It looks a lot better. So, let's talk about ISO. Again, this is the red button. You don't want to push it unless you have to. Uh, but at the, you know, there are instances where the light gets low toward evening and dusk and you got to start raising it. But you want to try, at the very least, just you want to make sure that you do not use the ISO. Uh, you know, keep it as low as possible, it is the last resort. But when you do, be very, you know, you, you just got to do it. And, and, and you know, it, it depends on your camera, but they'll go in increments of 100, 125, it just, I mean, a lot of times I've found that, you know, you usually don't go over 1200 or so, and if you start going over ISO, I guess 1600, you start getting a lot of noise. I mean, it, especially on newer cameras, even still, you start getting a lot of noise. And, you know, if you're one of those crazy people that start shooting like ISO 25600, you're going to get a bunch of grain, and there's also going to be a storm in there somewhere. So, be, be careful with that. Uh, and also this picture. This is actually one of my favorites. I call it Sharknado. And uh, just the reason is, it looks like there's a shark underneath that tree. So, <laughs> so you're never going to look at that one the same. That was April 15, 2013, in North Texas. That was a fun. That was a fun storm chase. Beautiful uh, uh, LP to classic supercell high base. Never really proposed to tornadoes. You know, we don't need tornadoes to have beautiful storms and good storm chases. So let's talk about focusing. Uh, for storms, you know, uh, you. I usually set my camera to infinity before I leave the house just to have it set up and ready to go. Because you don't want to, uh, I guess the best way to put it is that you're not focusing on something right in front of your face if you're trying to shoot a storm. And so you're going to get this beautiful watercolor look where the storm's really blurry and it's going to blend in the sky. You know, if, if you're into that sort of thing, that's cool. But, uh, you know, for deep depth of field, I talked about this F7-1 uh, to F11. Uh, and and the, the trick of the trade for this front to back sharpness with that kind of a aperture is that you find something about a third to a halfway through and you try to focus on it to make it sharp. And if you do that, almost certainly, uh, this road right here will be uh, in focus, these, these uh, plants right there will be, and then the storm itself. That was actually this last fall. I think that was the seven, September 1st Arkansas City storm. Uh, but or, or Kansas City, I am sorry. Anybody watching in Arkansas City, I am sorry for that. That was a slip of the tongue. I'm going to have a lynch mob after me soon. <laughs> uh, but uh, the ideal outcome is that you get front to back sharpness and you get these nice sharp photos. And this, again, everything I'm talking about right now also applies to video. I keep saying photos, but it also applies to video. And you want the same thing for video. Okay. Okay, so let's go into five practical tips to improve your storm shot. So we talked about some cardinal sins. Let's talk about some practical tips. These are very basic rules of the road. You've already seen this photo, but this is June 22nd, 2006. 14 in Canadian, Texas, that was just an absolutely awesome. Tim Marshall talked about those marginal days. This was one of those marginal days. So, you know, you, it, it, when, when in doubt in man June, you do chase. That, I will agree with them 100%. Uh, the first one, I've talked about this. Use your feet. Take your time. Uh, you know, you can, t it, I mean, some, someone can tell me if I'm wrong, but 
it's probably better to uh, miss a few shots and you know get instead you get great photos most of the time you shoot because you take your time and you frame it up a uh, guy that chases with Brandon go for it he will I mean he's a master photographer and he he, he will literally search a scene for minutes before he actually takes a photo. And I mean, it, it's just that. You, you have to use your feet, you have to figure out what you're doing. Uh, the second thing, even your horizon. This is something a lot of people will not pay attention to, but it's incredibly important. I mean, uh, I mean, th this nice even horizon, beautiful supercell up above it, uh, but a lot of people, you know, th their, their world's a little bit more crooked. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know why, but it's anyone. So, you know, you, you, you shoot something and it'll come out like that, and you're like, Okay, I, I, I see it. I see it. But you know, the, the, and how do you fix your, uh, the even horizon? It's just, it's again, it's paying attention to what you're doing. I mean, if you're sitting here shooting a storm like this, you're, you've probably got problems, you know. And if you're on a tripod, a lot of them have bubble levels, and if not, you know, you just kind of got to look at it. And you're, and just make sure your horizon's pretty straight. Otherwise, you kind of, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, you end up with a very crooked world. And, and you know, if you're trying to make an artistic statement, which I'm cool with that, that's fine. You know, that's, but so we'll see. I, I try to just include a single element to scale with the storm. I mean, that doesn't always work. You got in, uh, eastern Oklahoma or central Oklahoma, <laughs> you know, just where there's a bunch of trees and stuff. It's really hard to do this. I mean, you can't count on it. This is that same June 22nd day in the Texas Panhandle. I use this little uh, uh, oil, uh, I, I'm, I wanted to say refiner, but that is not it. And I am, I am from the oil patch, so I, people are really cursing me right now. But these little uh, tank batteries right here, just to kind of give the storm a little bit of scale across this open field in the Texas Panhandle. And the big key here is, uh, you know, if you're taking pictures of storms, don't make your storm photo a windmill photo, so to speak. You know, make sure you give, you, you, you make sure you give the storm some time, some room to breathe. Okay, now this is this is an example of, of I wanted to include this photo. See, this one's a little busier. You know, this is uh, in eastern Oklahoma. This is April 13th this past year, Overbrook, Oklahoma. There's uh, Brandon and Josh, who guys are typically chasing them. They were having a ball, I guess. But anyways, you always want to expose for the sky. You can see that right here. We'll talk about exposure a little bit. Uh, just overexposure and underexposure, you know. That's uh, that's underexposed, but, you, but the sky is exposed. And you want to make sure that no matter what, your sky is exposed. If that means your foreground's black, that means your foreground's black. We're shooting storms here. We're not shooting the beautiful landscapes of the plains when there's a storm nearby. That would be, I mean, I mean okay. You can shoot the beautiful landscapes of the plains, but if you're shooting storms, you want to make sure your storm is the thing that is exposed. And number five, I mean, this is the most practical thing I can say. Just get a tripod. I mean, uh, you know, you can get a monopod if you want, but a tripod is going to save you so much time and energy. Uh, for video, your videos are going to look better. You can do time lapse, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. And with photos, you're going to have much sharper photos. The tripod's just going to add sharpness to the photo, and it's going to look amazing. So, Use a tripod. This was actually, uh, Tim Marshall talked about this uh, day yesterday. Uh, this was the May 7, 2014 day down on the Red River. And this was after the storm had died, uh, or was in the process of dying here in Warrego, Oklahoma. So, let's talk about photo post-processing. Let's make those photos look great now that we've done all these great things and shot these amazing photos and they don't require as much work. Uh, so let's talk about photo process post-processing. That's a lot to say. Uh, how do you make the storm image great? You got to be modest in your head. It's a lot of people, and there are—I mean, there are so many guilty people about this. I mean, I, I am guilty about this sometimes. Uh, you know, you got to be modest in your head. You can't go too far. I mean, if you, if you are sliding those sliders in Lightroom to the left and right as far as possible, you know that—that's a problem with the storm itself, the image itself. So you know, if, if you need a lot of fixing. I think uh, Karen said it best, uh, we were talking yesterday, and she said if the image sucks, it sucks. I mean, it's, it's not coming back. It's not coming back from that. You can't recover. So, you know, it, you, you got to make your colors more realistic. You want to make your contrast pop, and you want to make your image a tad sharp. Uh, my personal image uh, post-processing post -processing technique, I'm having so much trouble saying, uh, is uh, I like to start with uh, realism, and then I take it just a tad over because I, I am trying to make an artistic statement with storms as these big menacing things I saw as a kid. And so I want them to be a little tad on the dramatic side, but not so far that you're like, I don't know about that. So uh, the per first problem you'll see is too much sharpening. I mean, I, I don't know how well you can see it, but there are halos everywhere. When you, when you go crazy with the sharpening, you'll get halos around everything. And this is a, this is a problem a lot of people see because they think sharp is good. Well, too, sharpening actually adds data in these areas where the, color, you know, where the colors switch. 
And what will happen is you'll add data and you'll get these crazy funky halos. You'll get these awesome pictures of stop signs which are glowing in the midst of a storm. And you know, while, while that's possible, a divine stop sign in the middle of Colorado, uh, the, the most likely scenario is that you just put the stuff, you put the sharpening a little too far. You went a little too far there, Calvin. Uh, no, too much saturation, you know. Storms can be purple too, I guess. I mean, I, I've seen a couple maybe, but uh, you, you don't want to go too far on the saturation. I used the wrong button. Uh, problem number two, you know, uh, you know, the clouds, they're a little too blue. The green's really deep. You know, that was a really green, deep build, but it wasn't that deep. Uh, and you know, you just get these crazy, uh, colors going on. You don't want to do too much saturation. Really, um, one technique I use is I actually coming out of the out of the camera raw. I will actually lower saturation and bring up the vibrancy. And I don't know what it's called in Adobe. I use Apple Aperture, but it's called vibrancy and aperture. And vibrancy actually will saturate the color and not add colors in. So I, I actually sometimes bring saturation down to get colors right. Uh, too much contrast. You know. Uh, Sometimes Mordor will arrive on the Great Plains. I mean, I guess. <laughs> I, but, you know, I, I, I have been chasing for 12, 13 years now, and I, I, I mean, I've seen storms black before, maybe like that, but I don't, I don't know. So I've, I've seen some pretty black photos before. Uh, you know, that, that's just, that's, that's too much. You know, you don't want to go too far, and then you get, you know, it, 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 what it does is that now this is underexposed, too. And now the sky is underexposed. It's a little darker adding contrast, believe it or not. And then you get these crazy funky halos through there as well. So, uh, you know, a little bit of modesty. Uh, that, that image definitely doesn't come out as well on uh, here, but you know, that you can definitely see detail there uh, on the regular image and, you know, it, it looks better that way. You know, it's modesty, it, it does an image good here. So. so, let's talk about distributing photos. This is the sharing part of the SDS. Uh, you know, always use a watermark. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say about that except just use a watermark. I mean, Come up with something and use it. Uh, the ideal size is 600 to 1,000. If you go bigger than that, the simple fact is people can download it and then go to the Walgreens or something and print it off themselves. And then, hey, guess what? You're going to have people collecting the prints just by downloading them and <coughs> that sort of thing. Uh, you know, if you want to distribute them online, you have places like Flickr, 500 Picks, you have Google Plus, Facebook, Twitter, you know, all the usual suspects. Uh, I, we personally, we use all of the above. All of the above. Uh, Like-minded groups are the best place to distribute photography. Uh, you know, on Facebook, I actually, uh, myself and Brandon Sullivan and Brett Wright, we actually run a severe weather photography and videography group, and that's where it's kind of a, this little corner of Facebook where you can come share your photos, and everyone loves it because we're all storm fans. So, you know, just find like-minded groups like that on all these uh, networks, and, you know, because it's just a place where people who are interested in them can see them, and then, you know, you can, you can just have, you know, it, it allows for some fun. I mean, Online, it can be fun if you get in a nice group. So just make sure you find a good group to uh, reach. So, and no talk is complete without a little bit of mic photography. This is June 22nd. Uh, again, this was a beautiful March of day. Uh, nice stacked lightning image. I, uh, the first thing, apertures. A lot of people will say, well, it's dark. I need to open it up. I need to shoot, you know, F2.8 or F4 or something like that. Well, that will actually often come to blow out your lightning when you shoot. And, you know, you'll get these amazing big, glowing spots in the image where the lightning bolt is supposed to be. So you want to step down your aperture, you know, F7 or or even lower. And shutter speed, again, you, you don't want to go too long or the clouds will start to blur. And, you know, I mean, it, it, that can actually, if you want to do that, it can create a really cool effect. Uh, but, you know, you have to be intentional about what you're doing. Again, you just got to be intentional about what you're doing. And you have to use a tripod. That is the, you know, I mean, you can try to shoot handheld at night, but and you know, that, that, that doesn't yeah, work. Uh, you can use a lightning no. trigger and or an intergalometer. Both of those will work great. Uh, lightning triggers will uh, give you that amazing, I mean, that they, they will work and just every time you get a lightning strike, you will get that. Intergalometer, especially if you're wanting to do time lapse, uh, especially like time lapse lightning, that sort of thing, that's a good call because then you can, you know, an intergalometer will take a picture regularly at regular intervals so you don't miss anything. I, I personally use the built in time lapse mode on my camera. But I have uh, friends who use lightning triggers to great success. And if you're just wanting to capture lightning bolts in the daytime, the lightning trigger is a plus, in my opinion. So let's talk about video editing and what the secret is, too. Uh, the, you know, a little bit of an admission. I love photography. I do photography all the time. But my bread and butter has always been video. So this is the part where I'm definitely a little bit more knowledgeable on even than photos, and I'm uh, 
you know, a big fan of uh, video editing and making great uh, video segments. The, I use Final Cut Pro X. I'm an Apple guy, so everyone can throw everyone can throw apples at me. But you know, <laughs> but seriously, I'm an Apple guy, so I use Final Cut Pro X uh, to edit my video. Uh, video editor doesn't matter as long as it can cut and arrange clips, and you can add music and mix the sound. Your video editor is complete. You really don't need much more than that. So. Why most web videos suck? And we're going to talk about web videos. And I use suck because I guess the shock factor. I wanted to be shocking this morning, bring everything back. But, uh, but anyways, the first thing is the shots are too long and the edits are too lazy. You know, you'll see this all the time where someone will have these beautiful shots, but they will go on for 15 and 20 seconds on this web video. And you're just like, that was a great shot, but there's no shot on planet Earth that's worth 15 or 20 seconds with no real movement. In it. I mean, there's just not. Watch a Hollywood film and watch the edits, and I guarantee, or TV shows, and what you're going to see is that the average time for a shot is two to six seconds. 